Hi, it's about today, domic acid and epidemiology and toxicology regulation. Perhaps you are trying to change it in uh, BC. I have no conflict of interest to declare, but some of the ideas that are being presented here uh, are examples. They are not for facts. I'm going to talk about mythology, modern history, environmental, biologic samples, and animal studies, and human results. Just to uh, imagine the story of domoic acid, there is uh, some part in Exodus which says uh, that Moses put his stick into the Nile and the sea became red and fish died and some happened in front of the Pharaoh. Uh, there are articles out there which are claiming that that was actually domoic acid. Uh, throughout the history, it has become a lot of problems. There is an algae bloom, uh, which happens some years. In the great history, uh, the history of Great Japan, uh, there are many instances have been reported uh, to what happened to the sea and fish died. Probably you've seen the, the movie series The Bird. Have you seen that? I mean, some decades ago, it was very nice one. Very, you know, maybe it's not as uh, nice as it, today. It doesn't seem as uh, you know exciting as it was. But that's based on the uh, true story. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock made that uh, TV series. Uh, the sea birds has become crazy, so they attacked people in the in the city. So he took that story and turned it to a, one of the most successful movies in the history. As for the modern history, an outbreak of amnesic shellfish poisoning happened in Canada, in uh, East Coast Canada, uh, in 1987. And this is the article that had been published in New England Journal of Medicine describing this syndrome for the first time and the association between the domoic acid and uh, amnesic shellfish poisoning. One of the authors here is uh, it's underlined is uh, Tom Kozatsky, who's the medical director of BCCDC in BC these days. Domoic acid is a chemical, is a neurotoxic. Uh, it's very similar to kinic and uh, has been isolated from the lead algae. It has a very complex uh, molecular structure. There are some reports in terms of the uh, environmental impact related to domoic acid. Uh, sometimes when the domoic acid and algae bloom is higher, then the number of whales stranded in the west coast are increasing. If you look at the number of uh, whales have been in, stranded in the past 10 years in, west, uh, in, in Alaska, it can be seen it has increased. It is more or less uh, on the same time that the domoic acid is being reported from the sample. So although there is no causal relationship between these two, it has been, you know, claimed that they are, they could be related. Last year, uh, we have the highest number ever in 2015 that the uh, whales were stranded in Alaska. Uh, as for the clinical findings in animals, sea lions are susceptible to domoic acid. Uh, this picture shows one of them with the uh, vomiting and seizure, which is common uh, as, a, as a result of domic exposure. If you look at the, this, this slide, the, it's a period of time from 98 to 2006. The one which is red is July. So, uh, and the number of stranded, acute toxic uh, stranded animals and uh, chronic ones are in gray and red lines. Usually it happens in the uh, hotter months of the year. Similar to that, uh, Sodonitsia australis, which is the uh, which contains domoic acid, uh, the amount of it is are very uh, correlated with the stranded Californian sea lions in different years that has been shown in this picture. Domoic acid attacks the brain. <clears throat> in 
hippoca hippocampus uh, and uh, make some uh, problems. Hippocampus is a part of limbic system, which is the old part of the brain that is shared between different animals include and, and human. And uh, it is related to feelings, but some part of it, including uh, hippocampi, uh, are particularly related to translation of the short, uh, long memory and short memory to each other. Domic acid affects that. There are claims in some journals and some sites that the highest ever of domic acid recorded in uh, coast, uh, in West Coast in 2015. It is probably not true, but claims are there. Uh, this is just a beautiful picture, it's not mine. Uh, from August to August, the sea temperature is high in August, then it goes down to January, February, it comes back uh, to the August 2015, that's for 2014 and 15. I've superimposed the average uh, domoic acid in uh, samples from West Coast BC. As can be seen, it's been, when it's becoming warmer, it's uh, happened more, happen more. And this line, the dotted line, is uh, the maximum uh, level of domoic acid that have been uh, found in the samples in the West Coast. So it's related to the uh, temperature somehow. This slide shows the uh, samples uh, from 2002 to 2015 in BC. It's 26,000 samples are included. Uh, majority of samples are negative. So based on the regulation, um, every week or every two weeks, the shellfish and other uh, seafoods are being tested. And uh, uh, if they are higher than certain amounts, then, then some decision will be made. Almost 98% are negative. Among the 2% which are positive, they are below 20 ppm. So according to the current toxicology regulatory system, if the samples reported are below 20, no action is needed to be taken. And it's OK. But if there are samples above 20, then uh, there are some consequences. The public are being advised not to take. And uh, you know, the coasts are being closed for uh, having some food, for seafood. Uh, if you look, in 2003 it happened, in 2012 it happened. In 2013, although it was uh, high a bit, it was not a big issue, but in 2015, when the total number uh, of samples above uh, 20 ppm and the magnitude has increased a lot, it becomes a public issue. This is basically the previous slide in another uh, format. During the past 10, uh, 15, uh, 14 years, there has been uh, uh, 26,000, 27,000 samples have been taken. Just 12 of them, just 12 cases, uh, were significant enough to, to lead to a public and uh, uh, management decisions. Majority were negative. 1.5% were positive, but below 20, which is the regulation. Uh, this slide shows the sample concentration of domoic acid in 2015. From April to August, uh, there are many samples above the lim uh, above uh, not which are not zero and a few which are above 20. So domoic acid in human induces two type of symptoms. One is uh, gastrointestinal problems. A nausea, vomiting, it's more common. The other one is inducing amnesic shellfish poisoning. People, after they're taking it, they go to a, a neurologic state that they don't remember uh, what, what is happening, what has happened in the past couple of days. That's uh, more affected. So when it happened uh, in, 2000, uh, in 1987, uh, 100 and seven cases admitted to the hospital. We have to 
uh, bring in mind that it was not recognized by then. So many people have been missed until they noticed that it's happened. And case funding was not complete. So the people who were admitted, and according to a chart that they developed at the time, uh, 107 cases were recognized to be the, uh, uh, to have this syndrome. Among them, three died soon after the uh, attack. One of them died a few months later, which is in one of the studies, it is also included, but three of them died. That's a better number, perhaps. Uh, the people who died were old, and one of them with uh, renal failure, chronic renal failure. These are the symptoms in the original outbreaks. Nausea was the most common one, following by, followed by vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, headache, and memory loss. So memory loss happened in 25% uh, of the cases. If you look at the, uh, how it happened, between time zero, the symptoms happen of, of consumption of, of the uh, shellfish. Majority of the symptoms happen in the first six day, six hours. It goes down maybe maybe by 24 hours. Majority of the cases are being uh, reporting some uh, problems. This graph shows from day one to day 29 uh, November that the problem happened. So first they, they noticed one cases and the residents actually between different uh, hospitals talked to each other and uh, uh, connected these this symptoms that this outbreak that has happened and case finding increased uh, very soon. They worked on it because it's important. Amnesic shellfish poisoning amnesia seems very you know, uh, dangerous to people. So they put a lot of energy on it. And uh, domoic acid was detected as the cause. And if you look at uh, here, uh, distribution of muscles in day 29 uh, stopped. And a public warning uh, was given one day later. And instantly, the number of cases who were reported dropped very fast. That's the beauty of toxicology regulation. If, if you do a uh, uh, intervention, it, it affects. This is probably uh, not a very good example of the outbreaks that are happening in toxicology. Usually, in because you're more familiar with uh, uh, communicable outbreaks, so one case happens here, and there is a latency, then a couple of cases happens here, and here, because the latency are different, gradually they become uh, overlapped, and it reaches a maximum, a plateau, which uh, for some reasons could be different, and then gradually it decreases and going uh, like this. So this curve is uh, usually the typical uh, outbreak of a communicable disease. But in comparison, the toxicology outbreaks are not like this. They happened, so you see, and they disappeared. Let's say a group of people going to a, a wedding, one of the cases that I've been uh, involved, and they take some food, and uh, botulism happens to, to them. So the cases are going down, or if the food is contaminated with organophosphorus agents. At first, majority of cases, then gradually, Afterwards, there are also some uh, graphs. If you look to the literature, that that are showing something happens here as well. And this second curve is is not related to the symptoms. It's related to the panic of the population. People with no uh, with far less symptoms, they they become you know panic and coming to to see if they are also being exposed or not. This graph is not a good example of that. That's because. Uh, that the uh, shellfish was available, and new people were using it, and we're using it again and again, and new cases emerging. Uh, as for the regulation, what happened, they, they were able to detect uh, shellfish in nine samples. Uh, and uh, so what they did is they, portion, they uh, put the portion sizes and eventually calculated that 
the lowest concentration of uh, domoic acid was 60 milligram. So if 60 milligram was ingested, so uh, the symptoms uh, happens. That's the basic idea of developing this uh, calculation. Somehow, EFSA and FDA uh, approach to the issue differently. Uh, so but what they did, you are familiar with risk assessment. So we take uh, an, an uncertainty factor of 10. If it's intraspecious, is another uh, uncertainty of 10. Uh, but this uh, epidemic, this outbreak happened in uh, uh, human, so there was no, no need to translate it from animal to human. So basically, that 10 uh, uncertainty factor works. So they put 60 milligram, and based on that, two, num two numbers that have been used are here. One is the, I have to use this one, I, I keep forgetting it. Uh, so it's 0 0.9 milligram per kilogram. It's the number that EFSA picked. Uh, Canadian, Canadian system is just like that, and FDA it's one milligram per kilogram. Then from here, something happened, which is a bit uh, confusing. There are 10 times applied uncertainty have been taken into account by FDA. But that's not the case for EFSA. EFSA, is, by the way, is, is the European equal to FDA. And they took 30, 30 times uh, uncertainty factor. Instead, uh, the acceptable serving dose has become 30, and for the FDA was 100. So anyway, both of them came to one number, which is 20. So 20 ppm is widely acceptable in the past 25 years uh, for uh, as the regulation limit. I've already explained how that is happening. In, in the initial uh, outbreak, people who were old, above 65 years old, and with chronic renal failure, they were uh, assumed to be the people population at risk. Since 1987, many things has happened. One, toxicokinetic data are available in human, and much more in animals, in experimental models. Uh, results of long-term exposures to very low doses of domic acids also appeared. This is something in the past 10 years. Uh, and better understanding came up from the susceptibilities that we will discuss. We have much more better uh, data available this, in these years. And in regard to the minorities, First Nations, and uh, at the time it was just for the commercial uh, samples that were available, but not for recreational. Now we, have, we are in a point that we can uh, develop this to a further stage. This is the population of the BC, pyramid of the population of BC. In the black one is uh, this population in 1987, and the white is 2005. Uh, if you look, the population of uh, above 65 years old in BC has increased dramatically, almost become twice. So the people at risk has increased. The risk itself did not increase, but the population at risk, the number of people who could be uh, considered a susceptible population has increased. This graph shows the population the same way of uh, uh, the horizontal one is the number, and the uh, vertical axis is the uh, category of the year. It was not available uh, for First Nations uh, five years per, per five years, so I couldn't do that. This is uh, the black one is First Nation population, and the uh, white one is for the general population. So we have also information available, uh, many information available, in, including the numbers, uh, to be discussed for regulatory system. Just to have a better idea, uh, as the, the developing uh, regulatory limits is very easy. There are many complex things behind it, but the concept is very easy. Uh, this uh, curve shows, let's say, the portion size of uh, shellfish. If people are going out to the restaurant and taking that. Some people don't like it just a bit. Majority of people are taking 200 gram shellfish in a portion, 
and very, very few people are taking longer, um, more than that. So what happened in the initial uh, calculation, they assumed the highest portion size available in the study, which was 400 grams. So we, talked, we already talked about the uh, concentration, and now we are talking about the portion size. So at the time, 400 gram was the uh, highest assumed portion size to, to draw the calculation. What they did, they applied 10 times safety margin, and uh, these numbers, as we discussed, has been developed. But there's a mistake here. Uh, in 2015, we called the restaurants in uh, BC, in, in Vancouver, and majority of them are saving on average 400 grams raw meat per, per person. So it, it increased. And for some of the minorities, including First Nation, <coughs> that is far higher. If, if you look at the, the original data, assumed the dotted red line here, that this is the First Nation, just like the others. But the, 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 the fact is that they are assuming far more, uh, consuming far more. And uh, it may happen two times a day, uh, which have additional impact. So if we take this into account, so the safety of margin for First Nations is lower at the moment. 10 times uh, safety margin is supposed to cover for different uh, situation between different people. But when they developed it, the assumptions before applying this 10 times was not accurate enough. Other information has emerged in the past 25 years. We now know that uh, domoic acid is being concentrated in amniotic fluid. And the half-life is higher, far higher in amniotic fluid. There are cases of animal studies that nine, nine days uh, it remains in the, uh, as a, as it's half-life in amniotic fluid. But in, in blood, uh, also some of the institutes, international institutes, said that it's not possible to draw a half-life because it's very short, but up to four and six hours also being reported. So nine days and uh, four hours are very, very different. So uh, now uh, it is possible that the fetus are being uh, frequently at exposure during the pregnancy, and also the, uh, the dose could be higher. So this group should also be taken into account as a, uh, as a susceptible subpopulation that has not been done previously. Another group are the infants of breastfed, no, actually breastfed neonates. There are reports that uh, DA is being secreted into the milk, but the amount is, very, uh, is relatively lower than the blood. However, the kidney uh, of neonates is not being developed when they are born. It is assumed that in a month, or perhaps it's better to say three months, it reaches the full capacity that is expected. So although the uh, secretion of domic acid in the milk is not high, but as the susceptibility, of, uh, as the capa capability of the kidney in neonates is 40 times lower, so it becomes 40 times more uh, dangerous for breastfed people, uh, neonates. Another group was, are the elderly. There are many reasons that elderly are more susceptible, and they were recognized at first instance. Uh, number of deaths, the people who died were above uh, 65 years old in the, in the original uh, outbreaks. There are experimental model uh, information that shows that. Kinate, which is uh, very similar to domic acid, has also showed that uh, a, a, an age-dependent uh, effect. Kidney failure is the same. Domic acid is being uh, excreted from the body, may, uh, ma mainly via the kidney. So, and there are some experimental models that show that, uh, as well as the human studies. Another issue that has not been discussed uh, in early uh, exposure was 
the very low dose repetitive exposures. In Canada, people on average are taking shellfish two times per month. But First Nations are taking four times per week. There are also higher than that uh, re reports. I've picked just one of them. So they are highly uh, exposed uh, to, they could be exposed to domoic acid. Also, they can take for lunch and for dinner as well in, in, in one day. In addition, uh, they have developed some sub-experimental models on fish, zebrafish, and, and animal other animal studies that showed that if they are being uh, in contact with very low doses, uh, they will lose the capability of behavioral capability, capability and uh, neurodevelopmental effects will happen. So repeated doses could have impact on human, which is very difficult to determine. Uh, for these reasons, uh, we assume that the regulatory system, current regulatory system in place, might not be enough to protect everyone. The second part of my talk is on uh, developing the regulation. You know, the regulatory toxicology is, is very difficult. There are, if you look at the, Sarah has sent us a, a document of 18,000 pages. Okay, so it's... Uh, it's difficult to read. Majority of them are complex, and you shouldn't miss something. So uh, you're dealing with a lot of issues that should talk about it. And sometimes we make mistakes. And uh, let's say domic acid is in shellfish, and shellfish is in very low, very low doses of, of domic acid. It could be dangerous. Then we, we, can we ask the people not to take shellfish? Or seafood? Yes, please. Can we say that? Is it good? Someone should answer, otherwise I'm I'm asking you. And more difficult questions. Yeah? Can we say that? Yeah, one, one, one issue is that. The other? Economics, yeah. Also. <laughs> it could be more dangerous. I, I will get back to this very important point later on. So, uh, and also, fish is good for people. Shellfish is good for people. If we say to almost all people, do not take fish, let's say, and just a few of them will be suffered, so you have to weigh uh, what is the uh, nutritional dietary advantages in comparison to the rest. So sometimes uh, the recommendations are problematic. Let's take this, this example. It's a true example that uh, in Bangladesh, the infant Bangladesh is a very uh, not mountainous uh, country, very flat, and uh, there are a lot of rivers there, and the population uh, cond is condensed. 180 million people are living in a uh, not large uh, part of the land. So the infant mortality rate in Bangladesh was very high. What happened, uh, as a result, uh, experts uh, suggested by WHO and gave the government of uh, Bangladesh a loan uh, to ask people to have some handmade pump. Because it's very easy. The water in that area is high, so in two meters, three meters, they can have, uh, bring water up. So it's very easy to dig, and a, a hand pump is very easy to be used. So what happened? A success because the mortality rate has decreased following this program in 1970s. It was introduced in 1974. So, very major advancement. Then, what happened? The water from the rivers, the surface water which were available, was problematic for making some uh, diseases, communicable diseases. But the water which is coming up from the well, very shallow wells, 
is full of arsenic. So arsenic exposure, toxicity has become epidemic in uh, Bangladesh. And it's a result, uh, when, uh, it's a result of all suggestions, or it's a result of all in interventions. What happened was, after 10 years, a group of people sat there and said that the arsenic is not uh, highly concentrated in waters very down there. So they suggested that in communities, they dig wells, uh, wells which is uh, deeper, and um, cover it inside, that they can bring up the water from very far below, maybe 50 meters, 80 meters. A success. So many people were happy about that. Then what happened is that the manganese is very common in deeper water. So the manganese is now becoming a, a more problem in, in Bangladesh. If you look in the past four years, uh, there are many articles that are coming out of the manganese and, and the impact on the uh, capability on neurodevelopment effects. So no one knows what is we, we are going to do next step. So far, uh, no one uh, figured out what would be the next uh, suggestion. So when we are dealing with issues, uh, we have to consider that marine food is good uh, and DA toxicity are, are not a lot. We have to think of risk, of collateral damage and substitution risk that we just talked about. When I came to this room, uh, there was a cupboard out there. I saw that and I remembered an, uh, uh, an embarrassing story of myself. I'm going to share it with you. This is related to the risk. When I was young, 15, 16 years old, uh, in a weekend, we went out with our relatives and friends. Uh, uh, as a party, I, I was uh, standing somewhere and I was you know, a 16 years old boy, 16 years old boy, and one mouse came. And my uh, you know, reaction was disproportionate, and, and, uh, you know, and people looked at me, and some of them laughed. And I was become embarrassed that uh, you know, that happened. So for no reason, I followed the, the mouse and chased it. I don't know, I, well, I wanted to get it, it was out of my mind. So it went to a, to a uh, room, and I went uh, towards him, and there was a cupboard. It went inside, up to here, and I saw that I'm going to lose it. So for no reason, I tried to kick him. And I'd done that, uh, the mouse escaped. But my leg collided to the, to the cupboard, and I broke my leg. And it was in the, in the cast for three weeks. So there is always a collateral damage for a risk. And by the way, the girl who laughed, uh, 10 years later, she became my wife. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, uh, you know, collateral damage should be taken into account when, when you are doing something, okay? Yeah, that's, yeah, she's, she's telling me that she's breaking my leg every day now. Uh, just joking, yeah. Uh, if you look at the prescription, that, that's from one of my studies in England and Scotland. Uh, for some reason, we realized that thioridazine is more toxic in overdose in comparison to similar drugs. But the companies and the regulatory system were not happy to withdraw it from the market. So what we did, we wrote a letter to 50,000 physicians. We said, we found this, and uh, we cannot change the regulation, but we would like to ask you not to prescribe. So it, and it was a problem at the time. I mean. Uh, why we have done that, how we have, uh, how it happened, it, it has some consequences for everyone who was there. But anyway, if you see the number of uh, prescription of thyroidism has decreased dramatically, but some other things has increased instead because people need the medication like that. So that's uh, another risk, a substituted risk that might happen. So let's assume that this substituted risk is more dangerous than the early one. It could, you know, destroy the, you know, the intention. This is one of the graphs that we recently generated in terms of the uh, PharmaNet in BC. You know that there is a system, electronic system, that physicians are required to uh, 
enter all the information they have on, on, in terms of medic, uh, prescriptions. It is now 30% in use. It could become, uh, the, the plan is to increase it to 100%. So some of our colleagues uh, thought that if that happened, they justify it, then the, the control drug, such as you know, opioids, could be controlled far more. And as a result, the inappropriate prescription will decrease. And then uh, the fatality related to overdose of opioids will decrease. So that was the idea. What we de developed is, is this model. If you look, uh, let's say I, I'm a physician and prescribing 10 people, eight of them appropriately, two of them inappropriately. If I don't, for any reason, if I don't do the inappropriate prescriptions, which is a very good thing to do for many other reasons, but what happens for these two? The, the two people who cannot obtain the uh, oxycodone, let's say, oxy. They, 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 they will not be cured. They will, I mean, they, they need, their need will not go away. What they do, they go to the illicit market. And heroin, which is there, or fentanyl, which is there, is far more dangerous than this one. So increasing the capaci capacity of PharmaNet and controlling for inappropriate medication is very good on many grounds. But it could not justify, justifiable, based on the, uh, this um, decreasing the mortality related to overdose, related to opioids, which are not being prescribed inappropriately any longer. So, uh, what can we describe? W what can be advised? We have the 20 ppm as the regulatory limit, the golden number. It has a stand as 20 for 25 years, which is very good. We may say, lower this line, let's say to 10. What would be the consequences? If we say that twenty is the acceptable line for the shellfish samples, if twenty ppm they include twenty up to twenty ppm, it's okay. Then we can say it become ten. It's more safe. What would be the implication? What would be the please? I don't know your names, you. So, yeah, fish and shellfish, or maybe a regulation if the regulation is being enforced. So many of the it has uh, economic consequences. People cannot sell, and it goes very further up to the psychological issues. You know, I know that one out of one hundred samples that I have, let's say as a recreational harvesting shellfish, it could be poisonous, according to the health system. Then, when it becomes from 20 to 10, I will be, if, even if I don't follow it, uh, it would become a psychological issues for me. Now, we are saying that uh, another approach could be a humbled, a more humbled approach. Uh, at the moment, we say if there is a 20 ppm concentration sample, then public awareness, uh, public should be uh, notified and uh, the, close, uh, the, the base should be closed for harvesting. But what, uh, what if for the pregnant woman we say, if it's 10, don't take, if, if you are pregnant, do not consume shellfish, even if it's 10. The rest of the people can do that. If it's 10, we can ask the people who are uh, renal failure, in addition to something else with, with large portion, we can ask them, you know, uh, limit your portion. That's another approach. So number, the 20 ppm, could be decreased. It could be separated in different uh, values for subpopulations. It 
also we can ask people to take a lighter portion of shellfish. That would also be a protective issue. Further research are being in all the toxicology recommendation. There is one sentence: further research are needed. So we can change the regulation for commercial and uh, introduce and enforce for uh, self uh, self recreation, not the commercial shellfish. Uh, and people who are at risk, old people, susceptible population, and uh, First Nations should be aware of the, of the problem. So developing new regulation is one issue. We can talk about the portion size, the amount of consumed. We can tighten the regulation. We can notify people. We, we could be more smart for subpopulation or uh, release some awareness. That's the whole idea of intervention. But should be aware that not to uh, overreact to this issue. So you, you are familiar with risk assessment. It's very important. It's very difficult sometimes to do. And there are a lot of assumptions in it. We shouldn't take for granted that risk assessment is enough. That's not enough. There should be the collateral damage, like a broken leg for a mouse, should, should be taken into account. Also, the substituted, substituted risk should be taken into account. The regulatory toxicology is a philosophy, is a philosophy of human impact, not just the assessment of risk. If there are cultural issues, political issues, financial issues, human health, and even social issues, all of them should be taken into account to give a recommendation for the public. That's the end of toxicology recommendation. Then it should be enforced. And even if enforced, do people listen to that? You know, there is always a gap between the science, that's my last slide, between the science and translating to the policy and people follow up. I'm going to give you a very nice story, a real story. Uh, are you familiar with scurvy? It's a disease of low, I mean, not being and not having enough vitamin C. It was recognized centuries ago, the symptoms, but people didn't know that. Didn't know what's the reason. Eventually, they realized that something which later on called vitamin C are essential to prevent that in the sailors. Just be aware, up to 19th century, 2 million people are estimated to have died of severe scurvy. It's, it's a killing disease. It's not just bleeding from the uh, gym. It's a killing disease. What happened is that when the Portuguese and the British realized this is an important issue and they should have uh, fresh fruits as a precaution and preventing of this disease to happen on the ships when they are going out, until the Her, Her Majesty the Queen f enforced a law that they, all the marine uh, ships should have some uh, fresh fruits on them or they have to obtain at any place that they, be, they, they will uh, sailing from. It took 200 years. So between the science and the policy is, is a long gap. These days, it's not as long as 200 years, but still there is a big gap. And even if when it's come to power, come to, uh, to be enforced, people don't listen. Not all of them. They have some uh, issues with the health system they don't trust. If they trust, they have some economical issue not to do that, or they take some risk. So the regulatory toxicology started from the risk assessment, but it ended in human aspects, human assessment, human health impacts, outpoints, and uh, policy changes to what people are listening. I have to ask Tom, uh, I have to thank Tom, because some of the ideas that are presented here are uh, his, and thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey, we've got time for questions. I I'm just going to ask one of the online ones first before we go ahead. What about kids and the question of dose versus body weight? 
Yeah, that, uh, it's a very good question, but that has not been taken into account uh, separately. We are assuming uh, concentration. What I was talking about was the concentration in the sample. It's 20 ppm. But it's being calculated for human based on the uh, per kilo. So for children, it's lower. So uh, the 20 ppm co comes out. Probably I'm not able to, to explain it uh, clearly. We have two things here. One is the concentration in the sample, which is 20 ppm. For drawing this 20 ppm, uh, the concentration per kilo has have been taken into account. And the most sensitive population at the time were, were, were used. So it's safe for children based on the old regulation and current regulation. And it covers also the rest of the people. Yes, please. Um, what's the policy nowadays? I noticed in the 87 graph that there was a lag between when a problem was identified and the shellfish was pulled versus when the you know public, it was a day lapse. Um, nowadays, once a problem is identified, do people get notified Instantly. right away? Or? Okay. Yeah, if it's above 20, it will, it will automatically go to the public awareness and also to the authorities, and, and they close the beach. So uh, just to follow up on that, that question, because I had sort of the same thought that um, unlike a lot of other sort of foodborne illness outbreaks where you actually are doing surveillance on cases, you're actually doing very active surveillance on the, on the source here. So is there also an, any opportunity to shorten the time between the testing and the test result? So just, that's just a, a lab analytical issue. Or, and this may already be happening, is there more um, use of water temperature um, to sort of predict more aggressive sampling? Um, so you could, you could even imagine that, you know, as sort of another measure, when water temperature gets too high, you close the fishery, um, you know, because that's a relatively short period. Is, is that being thought of? It, it's a very good point. Uh, the problem is what you want until they, what they do is very different. At the moment, the number of samples in the summer, in the spring, are far higher than the samples they are taking in, in uh, winter. In the past 15 years, there are some months in the winter in some years that there were no samples when I was looking at the, at the data. But the system is working very easily. Every two weeks they go out, they pick up some samples and coming back, and some days later the result would be released and they will go. And there is a gap always be between that. The assumption is if, if it goes up, if they consider, if they observe a sample which is five, six, eight, then the number of sampling would increase. But by no means it's scientific, it's just you know, they handle it, it improvise what they do, as far as I know. I'll just add to that that I think the uh, Vibrio this summer will possibly change policy around temperature, and certainly everybody noticed that temperature was strongly correlated with the outbreak, so you might get to a point where not that the fisheries will be shut down under a certain temperature, I don't think, but that they'll, certain, they'll go on high alert. Hi, uh, could you go back to your slide about sample portion size? Uh, the graph with like estimating? Yeah, the like 200, 400 sample size. Serving size, sorry. This funny me? Yeah, um, so I was just wondering, I eat a lot of shellfish myself and eat a lot of mussels. When I go out and order food, I'll typically order like a pound of mussels which would be like around 400 grams. Um, but you're actually only consuming certainly not that entire amount. So if you ask restaurants what their portion size is, they're going to say a pound. But the actual consumption size is certainly a lot lower than that. So could that potentially be where they're getting that number from? Yeah, the regulation has been set based on the raw meat. It's not based on the what is being consumed or what is... The, the weight when, when the food is served. It's based on the raw meat that they are putting in one uh, serving uh, session. It's based on the flesh. It 
It's based on the ROM. Yeah, based on the flash. Uh, ROM it, I mean flash. Yeah. Okay. So can I also ask a question from you? How is your memory? <laughs> Hang on. I'll just okay. check the line again. No? Do we have any further questions? We're going to end up wrapping up early here. Um, I'm going to ask one further question. We're, so we had some high demoic acid concentrations this summer. Were there closures related to those concentrations, and were there any reported cases of poisonings? As far as I know, no. Uh, no cases have been reported, but when, when the samples are higher reported, they, they took their measures. Yeah, but, uh, you know, the problem is uh, case findings in toxicology exposure is very, very difficult to do. I was in, before I came to Canada, I was exposed for 30 years to aflatoxin. And aflatoxin induces uh, hepatocell carcinoma, which is highly lethal. It kills uh, below one year on average. So in, when I'm living here, although I'm not exposed to a high level of aflatoxin, but the aflatoxin, which I was exposed to it, has a still some impact on me. So something might happen. I, didn't bring one of my slides to, to show the, uh, the t time gap, but uh, the slide was on this. A lady here, a young lady, feels backache. It could be related to osteoporosis. Why he has osteoporosis? Because his mother, her mother, uh, was not able to breastfeed him. Why her mother was not able to breastfeed her, ch her children? Because her grandmother was exposed uh, to organophosphates. So what happened in 1965 in Kenya, let's say, a woman is being exposed to organophosphate. So, so when he, her child is, is born, she doesn't develop the glands. When she become a mother, cannot breastfeed the child. The child, 40 years, 50 years later, is osteoporotic. So osteoporosis uh, today in Canada might be related to organophosphate exposure 50 years ago in Kenya. This, this gap in toxicology is, is always problematic. When you're talking about the microbes, it happens instantly. Now you are you exposed, you are diseased or not. But that's not the case for toxicology. So since you're a toxicologist, I'll ask you um, oh, just another question on domoic acid. Um, how, how is it metabolized, and is there any concern about um, actually toxic metabolites and cumulative effects of repeated low-dose? Uh, actually, closures? it has been tested, and it's very similar to kinate. And kinate induces the same problems. So the parental, uh, the actual toxic, which is the mock acid, is the active, the active agent. And so far, as far as I'm aware, there is no um, you know, metabolite that is more active than that. So it's being based on the pure KNET type or, or the domoic acid uh, exposure. It's being excreted without change, mainly from the kidney. And because the amount are very low, so it's not a concern, and I'm concern later on. Okay, this question's a bit off topic, but it's here, and it is on the topic of relative risk and risk communication. Uh, the uh, questioner is wondering whether you could comment on concerns over red meat and processed meats, which were recently been classified as a group one carcinogen by IARC. Uh, the, the best answer is that I cannot. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought, but uh, the question was it's there. It's so very I, complex. We have to talk 15 yeah. minutes for that. Okay, if there's no further questions, we'll